This episode of the Boss Rush Podcast is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the Boss Rush family of podcasts, head to bossrush.net or our Patreon at patreon.com slash bossrushmedia. Thanks for helping us build something better. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Boss Rush Podcast, a great place to play games and be better. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Deer. Again, alongside me, as always, is the PC Muscle Race himself, Leron Dawkins. Okay, so I got, I got. No, no, no. Redo it. Redo it. What's popping? Redo it. Why? Why? I said, I said, what's popping? You're you're redeemed. Hmm. (laughs) Questionable. (laughs) But also, I'm like, I'm like, man, Daddy Jim is leaving. Yep. (laughs) Daddy Jim is leaving. Leaving the Daddy PlayStation. Jim is leaving. No more, no more. Daddy Jim and Uncle Phil are fighting. What, what, what are we gonna do? No, no, no more awkward controller holding. Get Kevin back. <laughs> what? Kevin, what? Kevin Butler. Give us Kevin Butler. <laughs> oh my God! Not him. Not him. We need a charismatic leader for PlayStation. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Do we want Ryan Kevin Butler? Do we want, do we want Kevin Butler? Do we want Jack Trenton? Or who's who's the other one? We want Kevin uh, Butler. Uh, what's his name? Casserai? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just talking about. I'm just talking about the white dudes that have had oh, it. <laughs> racist. You know what? How about that those one the girl? Are, those are the ones everybody made fun of. I'm not being racist. Those are the ones. Every, notice every 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 non melanated uh, like person that ran some part of Sony has been just dogged on in social media. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's true. Also joining us is the mad pharmacist herself, Stephanie Klimov. Speaking of daddies, I found a video game that was like <laughs> that. I, I don't know how they put my life in a video game. <laughs> Hi guys. Well, you know, <laughs> some people learn to smell and things. Uh, this is an after dark recording night, so it, it might as well just spill over. <laughs> um, speaking of smelling things, also joining us is PK Power Pat Klein. The fuck was that? I it smells know. great. Yeah, sure. I, I guess. I, I don't know. I probably don't smell great right now. Honestly, I've been sick for like the last two days. Oh, no. You're fine. Suck it up. Uh, <gasps> um, <laughs> mm-hmm. Just kidding. Uh, how's everyone doing? Good? Wonderful? Great? It's it's Fair. good only because of this podcast. Man, it's been a long oh. week. Oh yeah, wow! It's only it's only Wednesday, guys. It's wow! Like the, what? Wow! The, the, the Wednesday is Wednesdaying, huh? Yeah, yeah, it is Wednesdaying. Thank goodness I have this podcast to look forward to. I'm glad you look forward to to seeing us every Wednesday. <laughs> I slept for six hours today. Oh, brag oh about it, no, no kid owner. Mm-hmm. Mm. Is it COVID or is it just random? Uh, I think it was food poisoning, to be honest. Because, like, two days ago, my stomach was just, like, in humongous pain. And then yesterday was spending a lot of time on the pooper. Mm. And uh, today I'm just really fucking tired. Mm. Oh, your body's like, I need to recoup. Yeah. Got it. Oh, sorry, man. like, you know what? I'm not going to work. I'm sleeping today. (laughs) I'm sleeping today. Oh man, sounds nice. Sounds sounds wonderful. Um, I wish I would be smart enough to go to bed earlier, but I've been staying up late to play video games, so you know. Yeah. That's why. Uh, yeah, brag about it. I did. <laughs> I did totally bra- bragging about it. Um, no, I'm happy for you. That's the whole <laughs> point. Play video games. Yeah, I played a, played a lot of games this week. Let's let's jump let's jump into some video games. Um. Laurent, I see you're still playing the same stuff. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I, I yield my time. You yield your time. Yeah. Well, I, I'll say this: uh, some developments are happening in Dead Space remake. Um, I found that I found the third of the, uh, the third of the four uh, unitology statues or the marker statues, which means I am one step away from getting the perf- getting that 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 uh, that alternate ending. Ooh, hmm. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I'm um, and I'm pretty sure it's gonna be creepy just because I just know how Dead Space Two turns out. Yeah, well, 
Maybe there'll be a different Dead Space two now. You never know. No, they're gonna. No, they're gonna. They're gonna. They're gonna. Pre- <sighs> My predictions are they're gonna basically like it's gonna be ninety percent faithful to the original to the original material. There's gonna be new stuff, just like how they how they did with uh, with, with Dead Space remake and stuff like that. Um, hmm. And we'll and then we'll see in what context the diverges from you know like the story path for Dead Space three because I'm still thinking that they're gonna do. They're gonna do what, like you know, like what Fox is doing with the Alien franchise. The first two, the first two movies are the only ones like that matter, and everything else is, you know, out the door. You know, and, you know that's that's what I'm thinking. Even though I, even though I, I love Dead Space three as a, uh, uh, you know, as a as an as a fan and enthusiast of the series because because Dead Space three gave us the most lore of what's going on in that universe. It wasn't just about, it wasn't just about how cracked out, you know, like people's minds get once they get, in, once they get in contact with the, with the marker, it was about, it was about what the hell is really going on in the universe. And why is, and why is the universe trying to kill us? I really wish they would have let you choose the character though. in uh dead space three between, between Carver and Isaac. Yeah. Because like I played it with a friend and I let my friend play Carver and uh, he obviously he got more of the fun experience because Isaac's a pro. He's gone through it, so there's nothing really traumatic and like spooking him. Oh yeah, it was yeah, like, it was. Carver was uh, like, "What the fuck's going on? Everything's I, I like." Get what you're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, yeah, like um, I played um, I played Dead Space co-op with um, I played Dead Space co-op with a person or a friend of mine who'd never played Dead Space before, but mm-hmm. he watched me play Dead Space one and two, so he played as Carver. And he was like, "Man, this dude is wigging the fuck out." And I was like, "Yeah, man, well, welcome to the life." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's no, there's literally parts of the game. There's literally parts of the game where, like, uh, because, like, because, like, there's, there's, there's three mandatory co-op missions, and they're mandatory co-op missions, even they're optional. Like, you don't have to play those missions, but if you want, if you want some beast ass weapons and equipment and stuff like that, you should play those co-op missions. But the co-op missions basically, like, you're you you'll literally be playing. As Isaac Clark, and you will and you will see on the screen the guy that's playing a Carver just shooting everything. It's like, dude, why are you wasting ammo and stuff like that? If you when you play his perspective though, like he's being attacked by every fucking thing. <laughs> yeah, my friend who wasn't very good at playing uh, the game, uh, he died a lot of times, and all I could do was just sit there and stare. Dude, what? So I look at this bad. <laughs> he's like, can't bad you help me? I'm like, nope, I can't see no, a damn thing see, that's going on yours. Me. The only th- no, no. There's one though. Like the only thing you see while Carver's doing all this stuff, all of a sudden these toy soldiers like just start shifting positions, and that's because like he's moving that stuff around. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's fun. It, it, it's fun. I really enjoyed Dead Space Three. I honestly enjoyed Dead Space Three. Like the people who complained about it, like y'all, y'all buttholes are too tight or something, man. Because well, uh, no, they, they reused assets. That was my biggest complaint: is the fact they, that every corridor looked the same. That yeah, that, that is true. Same. That is true. But then again, those ships are two hundred years old. <laughs> And and if we remember if we remember the lore correctly, like those people that formed SCAF, basically they were trying to get the fuck up out of Dodge because like because like EarthGov was about to run them run them the fuck down. See, Eight. trust me, this this guy this guy knows this guy knows. I could write Dead Space books, you know, do especially it. since Glenn Schofield doesn't have anything to do with Clister Protocol nor Dead Space now. You know, I I, yeah. I could do that. I could do that guy. <laughs> Uh, man, you should call Damn, it, police, you should call it dead. Pro- you should call it dead protocol. Damn, we're, we need we need Matt on the show. Matt, me and Matt would have a good time talking about this tonight. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Matt, you're not here. Um, I bet you, brother. Is that all you? Is that is that all you want to say, Leron? Yeah, that's pretty much all I want to say. Yeah, you, you guys. I'm playing Spider Man. I'm playing Dead Space. I'm still playing on Sea of Stars. Like Sea of Stars has gotten a little slow for me, but that's just because like I'm really trying to beat Spider Man. Like we got we got a deadline coming up for Spider Man too, and I need to figure out my pre ordering it or what. Like I've I've already made a decision that I'm going to go ahead and get the PS5 copy. You know, which even though I know the PC copy will be out maybe like six to eight months after. You know, well maybe that thought will change with the new CEO with Daddy Jim leaving. Maybe it'll start coming out day and date or something. Yeah, Hiroki Totoki is making those decisions. Not not Jim was never making decisions like that. Jim is the decision maker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, speaking of decisions, I'm deciding Stephanie's going to go next. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't really have a, a, an impressive library of games that I've played compared to actually both you, Pat, and Corey. So I beat Alan Wake finally. Um, I definitely got into it in the later chapters. Like the first chapter, I think I personally struggled through it. Half my fault because I'm just so used to the ever improving control. So, you know, some of the controls of out, you know, Alan Wake made me the spoiled gamer get frustrated, but a, I just generally got over it or at least took it with a grain of salt. And obviously it got more interesting. So I uh, really liked it. Glad I beat it in time for when Alan Wake 2 comes out. I'm very much looking forward to it. As a writer myself, I appreciate this story. So that's Alan Wake. I'm very proud of that. Um, also, I'm working my way through a space for the Unbound, Pat. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I, I love that I can pet and name all the kitty cats that I run into. Mm-hmm. Um, so really, really great, um, you know, graphics and just like all the small little things you can do in there. Like I, I'm still early in the game. I went on like a date with my girlfriend and you're in the movies and you just need to like press a button to grab popcorn. And depending when you grab popcorn, your hand might touch hers. It was just like cute, yep. small little things. They both get embarrassed and. Corey, is this our life now? We're, we're just going to be in the middle of, the, of, of, of a cat love fest. Mm hmm. Anytime, every game from here on out is going to have some sort of cat in it, and we're going to sit here and listen to it. Oh, hey, yeah. listen, it's not my fault that cats make great video game companions, okay? Did I make space for the Unbound? No. Did I make Stray? No. Did I make all the other video games that have cats in them? No. I'm very anti-cat now. See, maybe maybe in the video game space, they're like the best thing ever, but like in the movie space, like cats get motherfuckers killed. Like, let's talk about, let's talk about the first Alien movie. <laughs> oh no I... <laughs> no let's talk about how my cat in real life is awesome no not the one that pees on the floor everywhere she can go oh, I, I was just about to call that one out <laughs> no she she she's from russia she don't count she's a communist Whoa. <laughs> um Yikes. paxel saved my life from a dog she we're about to we're about to get we're about to get struck on the boss rush youtube channel we're about no to. no <laughs> my, my son is like wait a damn minute <laughs> my son is half russian and i love him very much no <laughs> this this i have two cats and they're polar opposites one's a jerk and one's like a complete angel but anyway we're not here to talk about my cats oh space for the unbound <laughs> uh and then last but not least tonight i booted <laughs> I booted up Pub Encounter, which was a game that I bought just because it was on sale one day in the eShop. It's like one of those like dirty games, um, but it was different. Like usually, it's like a bunch of girls in string bikinis, like Succubus, this or blah mm. blah blah. This game is about you getting it on with old <laughs> older men. <laughs> So it's like the complete opposite. So it's literally you go to this pub and there's like six different middle-aged men you can go try and hook up with. And I'm like, look, that's my life. (laughs) I don't go to the pub pub to pick up middle-aged men. That's an exaggeration. But it's, um, it's your typical like anime romance. So like a lot of the lines in there are so cheesy. I laugh out loud and my son's asking me what's so funny and I can't tell him because it's not appropriate. You could. How old is he? He's old enough, right? <laughs> yeah, start just another world. Yeah. Like the the first guy I'm, I'm pursuing is the CEO of a lingerie company and he's super shy and he's uptight and he hates women. And so I'm like, I'm going to make you love me. And so wow. It's, it's, Human it's, prerogative to change the man. I just, I can't. Like it's, it's so cringy, but I can't stop playing it. Oh boy. Um, Hub encounter. Sounds uh neat. <laughs> I wonder if, if if it's like it's got a good uh Metacritic how do I f- No, I well I'll probably look that up just for the sake of it. Maybe not right now, but I'm gonna wanna eventually pull up the description of the game to see if it's entertaining to read, but I don't know how to do that from here. So it's all I've been playing. Cool. 
Um, that screenshot you sent us from that game was <laughs> like, oh my god. That's the kind of stuff. All right, audience, if you really want to know, let's see. Dirty. Yeah. And it was early on in the game, and one guy goes, let's switch spots. Surely you don't want to let only me smell Steph's sweet scent. <laughs> Jeez. That means you need to bathe. <laughs> oh, only, only in these kind of games. Jeez. <laughs> you know, that guy has, like, you know, this look, like, of disgust, too. It's weird, right? Because when you look at, like, horny anime games, they're usually, like, of young, really good-looking men or women, right? This is a game about middle-aged men. They have, like, a thousand wrinkles around their eyes, but everything else about them is your typical anime-style hot dude. So it's weird. It's just a typical hot anime dude, but with a thousand wrinkles. (laughs) You know what they say? Every wrinkle gives you another minute. Do they? You lose know. a minute or you have another you minute? You gain a minute. <laughs> okay. Oh, and so and but but I don't know. This, this is a this is a challenge. I've already made out with this guy and he only likes me 19%. I'm just checking my stats. Likeability 19%. No, I expect at least 50%. So I, I don't know. That kind of sounds like real life right there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <Wow>. All right. <laughs> Uh, all right, Pat, you're up. <laughs> all right, so I finished another game this week. I put in a, a lot of long hours on this one. Uh, beat in about 65 hours. It is game 33 of 40, The Legend of Hero Trails to Azure. Mm-hmm. Wait, 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 65 wait, hours? Uh, well, um, a long, long time ago, but in America, it came out in March. A long, long time ago. No, wait, wait, wait. Didn't they just announce? Wait, 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 I thought the game just got announced. Trails of Reverie, I think, was the one everybody was talking about over the summer. Well, and Legend, they just Legend announced Hero. a game called Trails Through uh, Daybreak. That's it. Okay, okay. I was about to say, whole, what, I was about to say, what in the cheat codes is happening here? <laughs> yep. So, let me educate you guys a little bit on the Trails series. The Trail series started Amnesia. way back, way, way, way back on the PC before the consoles maybe started existing. I don't know. They were just called The Legend of Heroes. Um, but then um, when the PSP came around, a series was created called The Trails or the Kiseki series in Japan. And the this director has the inspiration of making 20 games with a continuous storyline. Oh, shouldn't it? Characters that just re, you know, come back and like a game can take place in like a part of the land for a couple of games, and then it moves on to another part of this continent and focuses on the things that are going on there. Uh, but the stories are all continuous; they all are tie in together. So this is one of those series that it is really hard to jump into one unless you play it in a specific order because the events are very tied together. Uh, with that said, though, Trails to Azure is game number five of the series. Uh, currently in America, the series goes up to 10. Number 11 was just announced. Um, after Trails of Azure comes the more well-known Trails of uh, Trails of Cold Steel. And that's a four-game set that takes place in a different uh, country just to the east of where Azure takes place. Uh, but this game series, like, I absolutely love just the ambition that this has. Like, putting these series together, you get to, the characters grow on you over time. The cities almost become characters themselves. Like, the city that Azure takes place in is probably one of the most major cities on this continent. And one where, like, one of the most conflicts takes place because it's, like, smack dab in the center between two feuding nations. Um, So there was a lot of action going on. The story uh, takes place immediately after Trails from Zero, which is the fourth game. And the city itself has just, like, uprooted a whole bunch of corruption from, like, uh, corrupted diet members to the underground mafia and so it's trying to you know stand out and be like we want to be our own 
state. And the rest of the nation's like, no, you're not going to be your own state. You're going to do what we tell you to do, and you're going to pay taxes on it. So this game particularly focuses on um, Crossbell wanting to declare its own independence and the consequences that have come about it. And I really enjoyed it. Like, in terms of most of the games I've played, this one had a lot more action and a lot more uh, stake involved than... Uh, some of the other ones I've played. Other ones, you may be playing in a, a military school and you don't feel like you don't understand what's going on until almost the very end of the game where all, where the world goes into like this whole civil war. Um, but it's, uh, it is a turn-based RPG. Very classic in its turn base. You have your attacks, your magic, you move around... Um, can try to break enemies if you want to or uh, take advantage of like turns to just kind of brutalize them but they can kind of do so also so there's there's a little bit of strategy multiple difficulties so anyone can jump in and play this and uh, a lot of side quests I feel like really help with the world building but the the trail series is absolutely amazing um if you do ever want to get into it, I highly recommend starting with Trails of uh, Trails from Zero, which is Game Four, or if you want something a little more modern, Trails uh, to Cold Trails of Cold Steel, number one. It, forgive me for my extremely ignorant question: Is the one that you just beat is that the one where they're releasing that DLC years? If you, the oh one no, that? you're thinking of Tales. Tales, not trails. I oh, see. I know I was gonna sound like a dummy. I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, before, like this, I think one of the draws to the Trails series is that it reminded me a lot of the Tales series, but the Tales series hasn't been releasing as regularly as they used to back in the day. So we used to know, get a new we'll Tales say, game like every like nine months. <laughs> I got. I gotta say though, Arise is the shit. Yeah, Arise is awesome. Arise is amazing. My only complaint with Arise was the third half or the third portion of the game was very um, um, text heavy. Like it, it was a lot of exposition, exposition, re-exposition of the exposition. Uh, walk That's over here. Mm. That's your typical JRPG. I know, but it just it's just like like the first part of the game was excellent with its balance but then the last part is like we have too much story we have to fit in <laughs> and we have to get it done right now remember sounds like you didn't like it Pat. Remember, remember, remember oh, i love years, the game when it, went to, when it went to hurry up mode on the second disc <laughs> <laughs> that's you know yep good old xeno gears mm. and that's kind of what one, it one, of, one of my favorite rpgs by the way yeah, yeah. xeno gears was great but it does fall into the the pacing issue so uh I, but tales of arise is great it's not my favorite tales but it's definitely one of the better ones um anyways that was legend of heroes the uh next game i have is the dlc to cyberpunk 2077 phantom oh, liberty i i can't wait to hear about this all right, so I guess first I need to talk about the 2.0 patch. This game, if you haven't played this game in like the last six months, this game's completely like revamped. The map is a lot better. You can set uh, what you want to pop up on the map so it doesn't like completely carry you away. Um, the con the vehicle combat is well balanced. Um, it's it's simple enough where like you push a button, you go into a combat mode, and then one button can automatically just shoot your weapon. However, it's shooting just kind of randomly at the vehicle, where you can hold down another button and then direct and like manually aim and then shoot that way too. That way you can you know aim for like the driver or another guy that's shooting you. Um, so those parts like it 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 was implemented nicely. Uh, they also revamped the skill tree, uh, so and by revamping it, they basically refunded every single one of your skill points. So now you have to rebuild your character again if you've been playing, or if you're playing from a game that you had. Um, it, in a sense, it kind of makes it a little easier with choosing skills, uh, but it's still like they still it's still like just a 
just a map of like all sorts of skills that you have to read and kind of decide, do I want to put a point in this or not? And then you don't even understand if like what you're putting a point into is like really going to help you or not. You just kind of do it because, oh, look, this one's good for shotguns. That's what I'm using. Or this one's a blade. You know, that, that's kind of been my balance. I, I don't like the whole min-maxing part of games like this, but that's just me. I, I just kind of want to enjoy it for the story and the, the sights. I remember this kind of getting really hyped up within the last year. Do you feel like it was worth the kind of the hype of it? Oh, yeah. Uh, with the whole Edge Runner um, Netflix show, that, that definitely really mm. helped this game out, but... This game is now what it should have been when it, Got it. Mm-hmm. came out. And um, like the the DLC itself is just like it opens up and it just runs. Like the pe- action pieces are just like absolutely chaotic. Um, the story just isn't letting up. The characters are like very very intriguing i finally ran into idris alba's character and i don't know there's something about him, that man that just like that turns me a little by <laughs> he's uh he's beautiful even in the game he's good he's got that deep i don't know what kind it's like a british accent but it's not i don't know he brings it with him in the game like I, I'm almost saying he's outshining Keanu Reeves' performance, but I always thought Keanu Reeves kind of pulled a little bit of a dull performance on this one. I, I yeah, I agree. I, I agree with that statement. And this is and this is before even knowing about Idris Elba, you know, in the game. Yeah, because I haven't got I haven't gotten Fat and Liberty yet because I need to sit down and actually beat twenty seventy seven. Well, here's the thing: Phantom Liberty takes place during twenty seventy seven. And in fact, by beating, so you can actually run. Wait, because you're playing, you're playing, you're playing as your character V, right? Mm-hmm. You're playing as your character's yeah. V. This takes place probably after like halfway through the game, but before you finish the game, because one of the things that you can get um, that can be unlocked in this game is after you beat Phantom Liberty, it unlocks another ending path to you mm-hmm. for twenty seventy seven. Uh, or like another like possible outcome uh, without going too much into spoiler territories. But uh, the story of this DLC is that you get called by a mysterious net runner uh, saying that she's on board uh, Space Force One, which is the new United States president, the NUS um, plane. And it's been hijacked and it's making a destination to a very... Uh, enclosed section of Night City called Dogtown. This is a city that basically looks like an apocalypse hit Nighttown. Like the buildings are all in ruin. It's dusty, like trash is everywhere. Uh, but it's also run by a ver- like a uh, um, ex militant group. So the law isn't, it's not quite as lawless as some of the other parts of town, but it's very dystopian. Like it's, it's, it, the section of town is almost, com- is completely segmented off of everything else. It's enclosed. You have to have special permission to actually even get into Dogtown. And uh, so you're guided into Dogtown through underground tunnels. And then you finally come up into the stadium part and you overlook the st- the sky where you see the presence plane incoming, and then you watch it crash into Night City, and that's when the title card comes up. And it's just like nonstop. Okay, you got to run. You got to go save the president uh, from this from the militant group that is possibly the one that's setting this up. And uh, the game just spirals down into this like massive like. Okay, so what are the events that are happening here? Like, what caused the president's plane to go down? Like, who is actually responsible for it? It it is a spy thriller. Your character becomes a like a, a spy for the U.S. government to help out rescue the president, and you have to awaken this uh, sleeper spy that's actually in Dogtown, and that's Idris Elba's character because he 
is like one of the best spies out there, but he's been dark for like seven years because don't, don't spoil retired. It. Spoilerize it. I'm not spoiling <laughs> that. I'm just saying that's the premise of the story is you have to find him and, you know, reactivate him. So there, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that goes on. This is dog town is not particularly big, but it's packed with nice. like vertical, like, integration and it's there's a lot to do and they also included like these grand theft auto missions as well that you can find cars jack them and then turn them in for special rewards nice very much like grand theft auto <laughs> that's another the side ra- the ray tracing in the game is off the chain oh my gosh like just seeing the haze of the neon lights through mist or just yeah puddles seeing Seeing photorealistic reflections in like water and on and on glossy surfaces and stuff. Oh my god! Yeah, this game this game is a very beautiful game. Um, if you had any thoughts about trying to get into Cyberpunk but were scared off because the initial reviews were bad, it's not that game anymore. This game is what it should be now. And highly. Hang on, hang on. Out. Hang on, let's let's take a quick flashback to like whatever episode of Crossroads the Crossroads show was. Because, or, because um for the longest time I had I had a plug on my show that said this isn't an episode of Crossroads if we're not talking about Cyberpunk. Hmm. So here it is. Here it is, everybody. Oh boy. Uh, here yes. we go. <laughs> listen to listen to listen to Pat's words as he says this, right? Because a lot of the bad reviews were behind were from people who were upset about how the game came out on the older con- consoles from the past generation and stuff like that. The game was built for PC. Not gonna make any bugs about that, but next gen systems like the Series X and the PS5 were handling it pretty well and stuff like that. So everybody got decent experience. There was a couple of things in the game that was broken. Like yes, there were cars that all of a sudden you know were driving on the road and all of a sudden they're flying. You know, we don't have, you know. A little stuff like that, but the average person that was either playing next gen or on the PC had a very wonderful experience. So sorry for you guys who had an Xbox One or or a or a PS4 base. You know, sorry, I have one of those by the way, a, a base PS4. Well, my boyfriend has it now because you know. But mm-hmm. I was playing Cyberpunk 2077, uh, tw- uh, 2077 on a RTX 2080 Super. Yeah, and I was I was lucky to get 40 frames. So. There you go. Yeah, I can't speak about the frames because I honestly don't notice those things in my video game plays. Um, but it it runs smooth. It must be it's nice to live in a world. It must be nice living in a world where you don't see the frame rate. Because my I God, don't. I, I I I if it drops if it drops from, it me if it drops from sixty better. to forty five, like I see it. <laughs> I see it, and it is not. It is not the best day for me. Here's the thing: if you only play in 30 frames, you're not gonna see it, and like 60 frames is gonna like, whoa, my head hurts type thing. But if you play at 60 and it drops down to like 40 or 30, your head's gonna explode. And be like, what the? What are you talking about? I have a 120 hertz monitor. I just I'm talking about it. normal people, Laron. <laughs> <laughs> not Mister Master PC guy over here. Oh, console suck. PC ulti- ultimate. Oh, I'm, I'm upgrading it to a 240 hertz. So yeah, good for you. Yeah. So that that's um, it. From what I understand, this is a pretty meaty DLC. Like the story should take about 15 hours, um, and then of course there's all the side gigs and the bonus of the whole 2.0 expansion. Um, and then I can maybe actually finish the main game too. It might be a while. I don't know. I wonder. Know. I want. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you're talking about the end of the game. I wonder if it changes the end of the game at all. It does. No, unlike it, like if you play through the Phantom Liberty stuff. Yeah, if you play through Phantom Liberty, it unlocks another ending path for you. Great. Yeah, that's what I was most curious about. I figured it did, be just based off the tr- the words the trailer uses alone. But um. yeah, no. Um, Based on your actions in the game, there is another like possibility for an ending uh, in the main game. Great. Yep. 
I could actually beat the main game right now if I wanted to, because I am at the last mission. But there's still so much side stuff that I need to get done before I even tackle that, because I heard a lot of the side stuff can actually affect how the ending goes. So I need to tackle all that. 40 games milestone last, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll still be curious what game 40 will be. Um, I can tell Make you what game is not, not going to be. Resident Evil 4 separate ways. Hmm. Don't spoil it. I'm not yeah. going to spoil it. Okay. But I will say it is uh, it is a delight. Uh, the story is fantastic. You play as Ada. And she's a lot more mobile than Leon is. Uh, grappling hooks. Yep. Gotta love the grappling hook. The only downside is being mobile and being a woman. She's fragile. And therefore oh. can be killed in like two hits. I was like, wait, he's a new woman. He emphasized that. I was like, where are we about to go with this? Mm. Sexist. Yeah, <laughs> Tell that to uh, Capcom. They're the one that made her more vulnerable to attacks. Oh, I'm aware. Well, I mean, look at what she's wearing, okay? Well, look, look at what she's wearing all the time. Well, she's a spy. She's not supposed to be. She's what you, you expect her to be solid snake? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, she's more physical than Leon is, too. Like, one of the things okay, now that is true. you do with the grapple hook to, you know, latch onto an enemy and, like, fly and kick them. That... Honestly, she was honestly her ver- her version her version in the mo- in the Resident Evil movies was better than, than Leon in the movie. <laughs> I gotta I gotta say the the creepy bug people at the beginning of the game were like super mm, creepy. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the bug person. <laughs> oh, <actually> yeah. <laughs> the sound effects. <laughs> I yeah, give they, people the idea of what's going to happen when they play it. <laughs> yeah, I've only uh, I only finished two chapters so far, and then I went to the trails. Like I needed to focus on trails and beat that. Um, but it's it's been enjoyable so far. Um, I, I've snuck around a lot of the time and kind of po- like picked off the guys that way because her knife durability is actually a hell of a lot better than Leon's was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, when the game forces you to tackle enemies head on, it, that just makes the game a lot harder. And yeah. they like to do that with like really enclosed spaces. And yeah. it's like, why do you have to do that? Seriously, yeah. game. There's a there's a part in a cemetery that I had a really hard time with because there's a lot of enemies there. Uh, but they really encourage you to stealth kill. Yeah. So, like I said, two chapters in, um, but for nine ninety nine, that it's a, it's definitely a hell of a deal. I can't believe uh, it was only ten bucks. I know. I feel but like this... they could have charged thirty and gotten away with it. You know what's funny is that this is also come from the company that just recently said games are too cheap. Yeah, but all their games are sixty dollars. Yeah. So right now. What they're saying is they'll raise them to seventy. I'm assuming. No, I think they want to have like even seventy bucks isn't. Uh, yeah, but they're not going to go above the MSRP of every other company. I don't know. One hundred and fifty bucks for the next uh, Resident Evil hmm. or Monster Hunter. <sighs> or yeah, Mega Cap- Man. Capcom I mean, I mean, that ain't, that that's stupid. But we'll we'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah. You don't think they're going to pull the rock star? <laughs> well, no, 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 no. The reason why. You know what, Corey? Talk about your games real quick, and then we're going to go to that topic. <clears throat> I haven't talked about Dave the Diver. Nobody wants to hear about Dave the Diver. I want to hear about Dave the Diver. Does it have cats in it? Can we can we can we vote Stephanie off the show? <gasps> <gasps> what? <laughs> That's what you... <laughs> Dave the Diver is awesome, guys. Just because of that, I'm going to take 20 minutes to talk about Dave the Diver now. <sighs> okay, I'm out. Bye bye. <laughs> I'm going to go. Just get- P then. Oh, I'm just kidding. Wow, we 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 really lost everyone. Okay, now um, I've only played it for like ten minutes, so I can't really take twenty minutes to talk about it. Get but, ready, uh, everybody, because next week when we come back, Pat will be talking about a model simulator that com- that's coming free to Epic Games tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'll probably be talking about Dragon Quest. Uh, the Adventures of Die, which is getting absolutely horrible reviews right now. You mean Infinity Strash? What a name. 
Dynasty Strath, the game based off of uh, anime, which tells you right now it's probably not going to be good. Anyways, uh, so Dave the Diver, it's a pixel game. You play as title character Dave. He gets a call saying, hey, would you like sushi? And he's like, sure, I'll like sushi. I'll be right over. So he flies over to this place called the Deep Blue. And uh, the guy's like, okay, first up, you're going to have to go and, you know, catch our food. And Dave's like, what? And he's like, yeah, you're, you're going to have to get the food. The, this, it's about this giant hole uh, that has all this, uh, like, all the world's fish are, like, coming from this giant hole. And it's like a prime opportunity to set up a sushi bar and just, you know, sell all sorts of different sushi. So the idea behind Dave the Diver is to explore the giant hole, the deep, uh, the big, the blue hole, or I forget what it's called, the deep blue, <laughs> and uh, find is like explore, to understand what it is, and also catch fish. Explore what's that, in the hole. Explore what's in the hole and catch <laughs> fish, because then the second half of the game is you're managing a sushi restaurant. Uh, so. Dave's a little disappointed that he isn't the one who's eating the sushi, but he's got to manage it as well. So once you get your catch, which you're allowed to go into the sea twice in a day, and then you then it becomes nighttime, and you take your catch and you put it up on the menu, um, and then you open up a shop and you deliver the food to people who are requesting certain foods. They may be requesting green tea as well, and there's a little pouring mini game to that. And as you run out of dishes, you have to quickly add more to the menu and just keep your customers satisfied, eventually building up your sushi bar and making money and exploring the hole more. Question, is the whole exploration portion like timed or is it just you have all the time for you to explore and catch fish? And then It's timed in the sense of you have a certain amount of oxygen. Oh, okay. And you have to come back before your oxygen depletes. Otherwise, you get emergency rescued, and you like can only grab one of your fish that you you know caught on your emergency rescue up. So it it it's a heavy emphasis of make sure you get back to the boat on time. Otherwise, you're going to lose like your entire day's haul. Nice. I might just play it. <laughs> I say check out the demo. It's uh, it's charming. Okay. It, it's a it's a very charming demo, and I'd love to hear what your impressions are. Great. See, you guys, was it that painful? I don't know. I wasn't here. Uh, I was in the bathroom. Yeah. What were we talking about? Rude, Pat. These guys are so rude. Stephanie, we're doing a book club on this. Okay. <laughs> just to spite Corey. Sorry, Pat and I, I are just going to be there. <laughs> Sounds like a long boring game so i'm not gonna be there you're a long boring game i am <laughs> yeah. i've been called way worse by women so <laughs> uh game. are you uh, done pat i'm done now Jeez. okay uh so i played a lot of games we already kind of talked about resident Evil Four separate ways i finished it um i like i liked it i actually think i liked it better than uh the main campaign um it's it's really fun the combat is very similar but like pat said you are a you're not exactly a bullet sponge here so uh but still super fun i recommend it especially since it's only 10 bucks i mean come on i've noticed in that uh the dlc i haven't run into a single bear trap yet Mm. are they there are there bear traps in this game i don't think i ran into one either you know, because I feel like it. every step I took as Leon stepped in a bear trap. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're there. I don't think there are any. I don't remember running into any. Although okay. I ran into like seven 7,000 of them playing as Leon. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I finished that. Uh, the only thing I wish there was, and I know that you're kind of on an island and you can't really get away with this, but I wish there was some environmental changes or not changes, but like maybe a new area to explore um, that doesn't look like the inside of a building or a tunnel or a, a open a death really. space. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, I played that. I played Townscaper. Uh, it's basically one of those game pass games for an easy thousand achievement points. I did it in 15 minutes. Uh, 
So that was cool. Uh, I started Alan Wake Remastered. I'm not very far. I've played like maybe a half hour, maybe 20 minutes. I just got to the cabin uh, after the restaurant scene. Uh, Did you put the lime in the coconut? No. Son of a bitch. Was that, is that a thing? Playing it wrong. Oh, well. Uh, It feels, it feels like, uh, like, and Uncharted or Last of Us and not in a good way, <laughs> like for the PS3 versions are so it's kind of like the combat is not great, but everybody says the story is great. So I'm going to continue. And also I'm playing this before we do Island Wake 2 for book club. So uh, I it said the game is only about 12 hours, so I should be able to <laughs> do that <laughs> in the next month or so. <laughs> Uh, and then the the last two games I'm going to talk about together, uh, Oxen Free and Oxen Free Two. I'm not really going to spoil Oxen Free Two. Uh, I I mean I'm going to say some things remotely about the story. Uh, I really liked Oxen Free One. I like the characters. I really like Alex. Uh, I took I took uh, Jonas with me everywhere, um, just because that for some reason that felt like the right move, especially because like uh ren really liked nona and i tried to keep them together and then i didn't want to take clarissa because she she's a bitch uh so uh stephanie you're muted by the way um did not... i just shouted she's horrible yeah she's terrible uh so i i took jonas everywhere especially because like they're newly like brother like stepbrother step siblings i guess would be the, the word i'm looking for and uh the conversations with him were very interesting i really liked I really liked the story and I really liked the ending because it uh, it was just really like one of those uh, like uh, inception type of ending. Uh, and then <laughs> the second game actually ruins the ending of the first game t- for me, at least uh, because it can it kind of changes the way you feel about the first game, especially if you play them back to back. I didn't really care for Riley and Jacob as characters in that game uh they just i don't know it I, riley just seemed like really depressed and angry about life <laughs> in yeah. a lot of the conversations and i tried to pick the ones that sounded the most upbeat or positive right and it's just like yeah yeah sure meh. i'm like God, come on yeah the uh, voice acting's great but like i was like dang like i know you got issues like we all do but mm-hmm lighten up girl oh gosh yeah yeah and i like as soon as i introduced the character rex i knew i i knew instantly like what was happening especially after she can like she says something within the story like i knew exactly who the rex character was and like because it's playing with time so i it was it was good it's definitely not as good as the first game and i don't like how they utilize the characters from the first game really um there was one point where like I did kind of appreciate part of it and like the ending is really nice, but like I kind of feel like oxen free Two really ruins the first game in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, I kind of wish I would have taken Stephanie's advice and just played the second one. Um, I almost think you should play two first and then play one yeah. in some, in some sort of way, because then like you kind of, meet the meet the main character of the first game and then you you go back and kind of play it from her perspective and then that kind of changes the story in that way so i liked it uh oxen free is actually like a really great game although the the one complaint i have is like you're really slow (laughs) yeah there's no running feature yeah really really slow Uh, so that's uh that's what i've been playing uh and then I also uh, now I'm going to be playing Alan Wake Remastered and Spider-Man Remastered because those are the next two book clubs we're doing of the sequels. So, you know, fingers crossed, maybe I'll play them. Leron, you're muted, too. <laughs> oh, wow. I don't, know, I don't even know when that happened. That must that was an accident. I'm like, I just realized wait, I'm on the Spider-Man book club, aren't I? I don't know. Are you? I think I am. Oh. Did we invite if, um, him, guys? I don't remember inviting Leron. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Then I'm not in the book club. Good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Leron, you're well, invited. I, I was going to say, especially for Spider-Man too, right? Because that's something yeah. that you have your eye on. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I'm we planning on playing. Plan on doing Spider-Man Two though in December, so you got to have it beat by then, Loran. <laughs> he's he's ignoring you. Yes, no, I heard. Um, I heard. Yeah, I, so he is ignoring. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, like you're gonna make me beat a game in like a month. I'm I'm planning on playing uh, Miles Morales. Also, I'm just gonna mainline the games. I don't have time to be yeah, looking that's, for back. Yeah, that's also so, what I'm doing. Yeah. I don't have time. Uh, no, I'm 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 crawling all over the city because um because I I got them, I got the Spider Man remastered. So like um so like it came with all the DLC and everything. So I'm playing all yeah. that. Yeah, I'll play through the DLC too because, you know. Um, what else here? Nope, that's it. That's all I'm playing. Uh, all right. Do we want to answer questions first or get to the topic first? I say we let's answer questions. questions. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, oh boy. Uh, our first question comes from our friend Eddie V. <gasps> what? Ed. Um, he asks, Are we in an era when Japanese and US developed games are coexisting in a positive light? During that 360 and PS3 era, they seemed to be separate separated for better or worse. Do you think this do you think the switch helped restore this coexistence? Now, why do we bring the switch up into this? Have you met Ed? <laughs> <laughs> no further questions, Laron. Uh, <laughs> um, when it means coexistence, are we just saying like popularity of Eastern and Western? Probably, games? yeah. Because like, if you guys remember during the 360 and PS3 era, Japanese games were like really Niche. not hitting the way they used to. You know, yeah. and I mean, obviously, Resident Evil tried to become more Western. With mm-hmm. five and six, right? I mean, kind of started with four, but five and six definitely. Um, and I mean, the 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 nickname for Capcom was Crapcom because all the games they put out were bad until probably Street Fighter Four, I would say. Um, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. know. That's I particularly enjoyed Street Mega Man. People loved Street Fighter Four when it came out. I did not. Now Street, and this is the guy that played all the Street Fighter games. Well, look at you, Leron. Why, why don't you just be an elitist about fighting games too? PC. <laughs> Fighting games. What else, Leron? Monster Hunter. Honestly, honestly, my my second and my Monster Hunter experience got better once I played them on PC. Uh, uh, and so like, but we're, but we're not, but we're not here to talk about that. No, I would I'll actually just... say. Oh, sorry, Stephanie. Go. No, no, you. I was gonna say. I think the rise of popularity in Western games, at least in my view, came when the Xbox was released because you had Halo. And Halo 2 were super popular uh, with online stuff like multiplayer became super popular and Rainbow Six 3 became super popular. And uh, then like when you get to PS3 and Xbox 360, you got games like Gears that were really popular. And obviously, like Western RPGs became popular. I see you, Leron. I'm debating on whether or not I should let you talk. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna say this and I don't know, it might be, it might be a hot take for some, but, but I kind of, I kind of believe that my feelings kind of translates to like a certain part of the gaming community. When we got to the Xbox era, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to call it the Xbox era because we know the PS2 was like chugging, right? When we got to the Xbox era, a lot of people realized that they had outgrown like certain types of games, you know, like mm-hmm. You hear me say time time in, time out sometimes that you know, like um I outgrew Nintendo at a certain phase. Like like yeah, I'm back in Nintendo's ecosphere but for a while. Like Nintendo was lucky if I even looked at buying a console from them, you know. Um and when we look at this like Japanese versus US development, and I'm just gonna say I'm just gonna say East ver- eastern developed versus western developed games and stuff like that. Yeah, like things were changing. Like we like a lot of people were tired of the quirkiness, you know, of like jrpgs they were tired of the, the length you know because like with the exception of elder scrolls of course you know like like you know like people were tired of playing like rpgs that they had to sink like a thousand hours into the beat properly mm-hmm. and stuff like that you know things of that nature uh people were tired of like kind of like the weird chunky mechanics that some games had whether it was an rpg game whether it was a whether it was um whether it was an action platformer type game whether it was just a simple puzzle game stuff like that people were kind of tired of that you know and the xbox era came in at this time where people didn't realize they were tired of one thing until like we started seeing like 
like Jade Empire, uh, Co- mm-hmm. Kotor, right? Mm-hmm. Kotor is an Xbox gamer. Yeah, stuff like that. You know, people did not realize that Halo, Halo was revolutionary. You know, and this is and this is considering that we had Counter Strike before Halo ever came out and stuff like that. You know, but it was a different it was a different experience. And it was also a different way that gamers were able to play console games and stuff like that. You mm-hmm. know, um, now the only problem is is that yeah, it did start a divide because they're like. All the all the Western developers were making games like that, and Japan was kind of like staying in his, in his own little little corner, or its own lane, or whatnot. So the disparities just started showing up right there and stuff like that. You know, GameCube comes out. GameCube n- looked like Nintendo actually matured some because you know, like we were seeing more M-rated games on that on their platform all, all of a sudden, stuff like that. Yeah, we're still we're still getting our Pikmin's, we're still getting our. Mario, uh, Super Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine, which I, I love Mario Sunshine, but that's, but you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, and, but, and also GameCube had the fortune of inheriting a lot of dr- uh, Dreamcast like holdovers, you know, because the Dreamcast died like in what the, the first two years of, of, uh, of, of, of it was out for 18 months before they pulled the plug. Exactly, exactly. And the GameCube had been around for like a hot minute and stuff like that. So, you know, so, so yeah, so. So when we look at this, are we in an era where games, you, Japanese US developed games are coexisting in a more positive light? I think it's because like overall, like the trajectory of gaming has shifted. Like like Japan is starting to come out of its shell, you know, as far as like what they what they're willing to do with their games and stuff like that. I mean, shit, wasn't it last year we were talking like, you know, like uh like Sega didn't want judgment to come to PC because they were thinking modders are gonna like make make sex mods for the for the main character who's an actor. It was an actor. It was a real credible actor in Japan. <laughs> Spoilers that probably would have happened without a PC port anyway. It just would have taken a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because you know what? This is, you know, the scope of gaming has changed. And, you know, as and when 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 technology gets more powerful, whether it's consoles, whether it's cell phones, whether it's PC and stuff like that, things are going to things are going to look different. Things are gonna, gamers are going to scope the games to how they want their experiences and stuff like that. You know, and things like that. So I'm kind of glad that you know uh, Japan and the U.S. has have stepped up their games. You know, well, Japan and the West have stepped up their game as far as how they develop games and stuff like that. You know, like we're getting we're getting past like the parts where like a lot of this stuff feels like shovelware. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think and I think that's something that we can appreciate. Now, do I think the Switch helped restore this coexistence? No, because the reason why I say this is because. A major part of the uh, Nintendo uh, strategy with the Switch is they re-released all the Wii U games. You know, I think we only have like Corey. Like, I think what, we only have like two or three that, that have not made it yet. I, I think there are definitely under five Wii U exclusives that uh, yeah haven't made it over, and that's because yeah. like two of them require two screens, and the other two are Zelda games. And then I would argue that the other ones that didn't ca- come over, we got sequels to almost right away, like. Yoshi's uh Wooly World got Yoshi's Crafted World right and uh mm. <clears throat> Kirby obviously is Kirby and there's all kinds of Kirby trash everywhere so <laughs> yeah but but um but and that's just that's just one facet of it like you know this if anything the switch the switch helped revamp like uh like Nintendo's like Nintendo's appeal following the Wii U because mm-hmm. the Wii U basically was if they didn't have 3DS like the Wii U was going to bury Nintendo yeah, I mean the 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 Wii U. See, the thing is, though, is like the Wii U had Wii U so many great games. Right. Yeah, the Wii U sold. It all didn't right. sell great. Right. At all. Well, just over thirteen. I was, I was being, I was being nice, Corey. I was being nice. You know, the thing I don't always do. Console sold, sold like trash. <laughs> okay, like Corey Derek said it. <laughs> note, note the date and time. Corey Derek said that. Laron Dawkins did not. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just I'm just saying it how it is. I love the Wii U. It's like one of my favorite Nintendo consoles of all time. But yeah, skewed our top Nintendo consoles ranking. Gosh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, but also, but Nintendo, Nintendo has just, in my opinion, just now started taking risks. You know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. They've just now started taking risks, and they're only and they're taking risks now. Like the 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 Switch is close to six years old, and it is five years old. So they're just now taking risks, you know, in my opinion, over the last two and a half years of, of his life cycle and stuff like that. And good for them because, like, the more and more stuff they do now, I've noticed, like, the NSO has, like, lost momentum. Like, I, I'm not sure. This is where I think – this is where I think 
they were they were already trying to work on developing the new the new console. Yeah, we're talking about Switch Two all of a sudden now. This is where I think they're already they're already thinking about the Switch because like the uh, the Switch Two because like their roadmap is at an end for like all the retro game releases right now. Are we gonna see a new roadmap? You know, going into next year, we don't know. You know, it's kind of scary because like because like the one thing that the, the one thing that the masses were were clamoring for with, with this current hardware for the Switch is like more retro titles and yeah we got some we got some nice ones like 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 stephanie like was was like beating me about the head like, nobody wants game boy games on the switch and those games came out and they were like the most downloaded games ever and i was like oh wow i would Shut me the fuck up. <laughs> i would i would argue that a lot of nintendo's first party stuff is already there because they don't release all, I mean up until the switch they don't release a lot of first party stuff right and the with third party stuff it's about licensing a lot of them are in collections already like Mega Man would have been the perfect games for that but like they sell the collections right or uh mm-hmm. Konami released the Castlevania collections right so like getting third party games on those platforms are hard I'm shocked they put Sega Genesis on there to be honest cuz they have Sega collections Sonic collections Sonic remakes and all that kind of garbage right like yeah. And even if you go into the um, Sega Genesis one, like it's the ones it's the games that you expect, but there's only one Sonic game on there, maybe mm-hmm. two. Right. I mean, Sonic 2 is definitely on there and Sonic Spinball, I think, is on there. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know, man. I I think I, I, I appreciate the effort for oh. with the Genesis, but I wish there would be more interesting games on there. Um they're definitely there's yeah. a whole lot of the Game Boy Advance library that they could still bring over. Yeah, now for Nintendo, like know, we need Metroid Zero Mission. We could do the Golden yes. Suns. In other- well, no, Golden Sun. Golden Sun is coming. Mm-hmm. They announced some Golden, Golden Suns at the end. Golden Suns is at the end of this roadmap. Yeah, okay. didn't they already announce Zero Mission too, or did they just was it just I- fusion? I I I don't think I've seen anything about Zero Mission because like I would I would have been doing backflips on this on, on this podcast show whenever that whenever that happens, like yeah. you, like you saw you you saw how I ran like like quick fast in a hurry to get uh get Prime remastered like like wait like wait it just came out twenty yeah. minutes ago, which <laughs> I would immediately spent forty dollars on that. Did I have to spend for? <laughs> no, not the funny thing is people are begging for GameCube games, and. The thing is, is GameCube is the perfect console to remaster because yes. it's in that era where like those games still look good, right? Mm-hmm. On you know on the GameCube, but like if you just put a little effort in updating them, they'll sell. I mean, look, they, we've gotten we've gotten Paper Mario, uh, Mario Sunshine, Metroid Prime, Bat and Kados one and two, Pikmin one and two. Um, there's there's a lot of GameCube games on this uh, on the switch that have been remastered quote unquote and uh i don't know i just i feel like that that's the route they're going with gamecube you you put them out for 30 or 40 bucks hd remastered i mean don't get i mean metroid prime remastered looks like a like a brand new switch game right that game looks really hurry the hell up from prime two and three i know hurry up I'm shocked they didn't announce those at the and, last. Round. And where's where's our? I know you guys are. I know you guys are cooking something for Samus Returns. I know you guys are. You, yeah. you, you got to be, be, huh? Samus Returns. No, I mean, I mean, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna do something to port the the 3ds game. They're, they're already porting do, I, 3ds games. Exactly, exactly. And you know, I just recently, I just recently played. I just recently replayed a little bit of a uh, Samus Returns on my uh, Rog Ally. You know, the emulation machine. You know, and stuff like that. You don't need a second screen for that game. You don't. Mm -mm. Yeah. I mean, they kind of stopped doing that uh, probably halfway through the 3DS's lifestyle or whatever life life cycle. Yeah. (laughs) I said lifestyle. Uh, Like a lot of that is just a lot of that is just map and inventory management, which you just press select and it'll bring up the screen. Right. So uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but but to go ahead and finish out this que- uh, the answering this question here, um, I don't think they're co- I don't think they're coexisting in so much positive light. Like everybody just shares the same space now. I think that's the I think that's the best way to answer this question. Everyone shares the same space. Like like we have like one two three. We have literally four generations of gamers that are playing games right now. You've got you've got you've got me the gen you got me the Gen Xers. You know we got millennials. We got we got their kids, and we got brand new people like shit. Like you know the we the we brought in like like 
boomers into the into the gaming sphere and stuff like that so now there's practically something out there for everyone and stuff like that Mm -hmm. so it's diverse which is great which is great you know um things get more diversified which means we get more people interested in gaming so like that everything from mobile gaming to freaking console gaming to pc gaming to vr gaming uh to what else um you know to to all these handhelds and all these all these chip things people were building raspberry pis just to play more video games and stuff like that raspberry pi devices just play more video games so yeah i think i think it's just coexisting now i think and that's the good thing you know yeah i uh to bring a, a a point on this question, I would actually argue, argue Nintendo didn't do anything to to bring Japanese games to fruition because Nintendo's always they played sh- by their own drum, and it's like Nintendo brought themselves back into the 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 mainstream fold, right? But like, I don't think they've done anything special to like really make Japanese games more popular. I, really I agree. Don't. I, 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 I think agree. with Nintendo, and maybe this is why Eddie thinks that it you know nintendo brought japanese games back nintendo and japanese games have always been a hit with the handheld systems the 3ds the ds the game boy advance plenty of japanese games on that um but the japanese gamers they like the portable stuff they like, yeah, yeah they and like i think yeah. the switch like the maybe the reason why I've, like there feels more japanese on the switch is because the switch is the hybrid portable console system i'm gonna i'm gonna say this if the switch didn't if, if well if nintendo didn't sell well outside of japan nintendo would still be all right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if yeah i to say that if we if we live in this hypothetical world where nobody where let's just put you know you remember back in the day like certain certain cons certain games and certain consoles just never came to the united states mm-hmm. if, if nintendo was one of those they would still be all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, there's still games that Japan gets that we still, d- that we don't. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Ain't nobody got money to be localizing every goddamn thing for us. First guy gene out here in the United States and <laughs> Canada. <laughs> oh. All right. We're going to move on to our second question here. Uh, it's from the one true James via discord. Uh, how do you feel about Capcom's suggested price changes? Um, I think that Capcom still sells their games at $60 and they want to move to 70 like everybody else at first. And I actually think next gen, they're going to move to $80. Um, in my you opinion, think, you think, you think the entire, the industry is going to shift to $80 mm-hmm. unless it's, uh. unless it's a cross gen title, right? Like remember at the beginning of the, this generation, Xbox was still selling their games at $60 because they could still be played on Xbox one. Yeah. And like Redfall, I think, was the first seventy dollar title that they put out. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's gonna be something like that. Like Xbox is obviously still gonna be like, oh, you can probably play the first year of games we put out on the Series X natively. You think so let me ask you this then, because like I, I my hot take on this was it's going to happen across the board no matter what. Mm-hmm. Nintendo did it just recently, and people always feel like Nintendo is a safe space when it comes to the gamers with news flash, they are not. Well, Nintendo um, said they're gonna do it on a game to game to game, game basis. By game basis. Mm-hmm. Which I mean uh no, I'm sorry. I'm I'm well, see, here's that's that's ni- that that's nice that they say that, but the fact that they, they started doing it means mm-hmm. there's now a precedent. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think Zelda will always be seventy dollars. Like in the next three D Zelda will always be seventy dollars. The next three D Mario will be seventy dollars. Any mm-hmm. like tent pole, you know, triple A game from Nintendo, right? But like Mario Wonder is sixty dollars. Mario RPG is fifty dollars. You know, the Peach and Luigi's Mansion game. Luigi's Mansion is probably going to be forty or fifty bucks. Peach will be fifty or sixty. Like they're still exp- they're they're in that exploratory phase, right? Where they're like kind of exploring the price line. This is the company that never drops the prices of their other games. Like the games could be fucking twelve years old and, and it's still sixty dollars. <laughs> or more if they're if they're on a different console. <laughs> yeah, but you, but you get what I'm saying, right? Like mm-hmm. like like n- n- the idea of Nintendo would have this tiered approach, but and then you sit around and you sit there thinking, well, why is this game forty dollars? Like wh- what's what's bad about it? That's what exactly what's gonna happen. Like you're gonna look at these seventy dollar games like Tears mm-hmm. of the Kingdom, and then you're like if that Princess Peach game comes out at the fifty dollar tier, for example, everybody's gonna like, uh, what's wrong with this game? Yeah, I think you know, Captain, Captain Toad came out at forty dollars, and that was a that was a budget, you know that that was a budget buy, you know, it turned out to be a really good game. Like I'm actually when Captain I played the demo, forty I, on 
the Wii U. Yeah. I feel like that was a 40 game because it was a port. Yeah. Well, um, the Wii U, why weren't, it was, why weren't there other ports like $40? It was, thir- it was thirty nine ninety nine on the Wii U also. Okay. Yeah. Well, why weren't there other ports $40 as they should have been? Because Mario will sell at sixty dollars, and Donkey Kong will sell at sixty dollars, and Zelda will. Yeah, I, I mean, know, Metroid, I Primary, Ma- Metroid mm-hmm. Primary Metroid Primary Master was forty. Pikmin, yeah, Pikmin One is thirty. You know, Metroid Primary Master was a fifty dollars game when it came when it was brand new on GameCube, right? Uh, Metroid Prime was fifty dollars. That whole generation yeah, exactly. was fifty dollars. Exactly. Yeah. All I'm. All, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's kind of it's kind of weird. And you guys know I kind of hold Nintendo to a different standard than I do Microsoft and on um, PlayStation, um, because I feel like Nintendo Nintendo knows Nintendo knows and the fan and the fans like enable this. Nintendo knows they can get away with a lot of this stuff. You know, like they set up. If they're, if they're, yeah, if they if they're coming out with, with a tiered if they're coming out with a tiered like you know like lineup, like I'm I'm that I'm that pragmatic gamer. Is like what's wrong with this game? You know, like. Princess Peach, like this, this is a person that exists in the Super Mario canon. Why is her game cheaper than everybody else's game? <laughs> because Peach isn't the main character, right? I, I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying. I'm just throwing it out there. Not my decision. That's Super Princess Peach. Super Princess Peach was a full price game when it came out on 3ds. That's the one it, where she fought with her emotions, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> No, that game was great. I loved it. It was. It was. A, it was great. Like, it was I, fun. I was. I was a little. I was a little pissed when I saw Trails. Like, man, crying is her. Crying is her attack mechanism. Like, what? And then she <laughs> goes. Yeah, and I was like, oh, this game, this game, this game, this game is off. Yeah. <laughs> but I but I'm. It. You know, I'm. I'm. I'm just saying. Like, you know. Um. I mean, I agree with you. I'm not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's wild that you're thinking games will go up to eighty bucks the next console generation. Um. It's a possibility because, like, they're going. Well, I, actually, I think I think you know. It, I think what. Oh, go 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 ahead, go ahead, Corey. I think and what back. Atlas did with the Nintendo 3DS, like Nintendo was doing games at thirty five bucks for the 3DS, but Atlas was like shooting them at fifty. Yeah, like, I remember I, that. Those, per, I mean, the Persona yeah. games were super. I mean, I think people that were into Persona, you know, Persona Q one and two, like those were fifty bucks, and I think people. The pe- people who were into Persona when it wasn't as big flocked to the, those games. It wasn't even Persona. Even the Yetrin Odysseys were coming out at like fifty bucks. Mm-hmm. I remember the, th- I... the the what sixth one was fifty bucks, mm-hmm. maybe five and six. But I, like I could, if Capcom really wanted to, like if they put the effort into the game, I, yeah, they could have a seventy dollar, even an eighty dollar game if they wanted to on the Switch. And you know, if it's a Monster Hunter, I could see people doing eighty bucks to pay. You know, yeah. For that I game. mean, once somebody takes the dive, everybody's you know, going to do it, right? So yeah, true. If that's the general price for games across the board, then yeah, like that's that's what's going to happen. But you, but I feel like, but I feel like right now, like a lot of companies are tiptoeing towards a seventy dollar line. So you know, I feel like seventy dollars is going to be the norm. But by the time the the console refreshes come out, everything will be seventy dollars. Yeah. I, now uh, the the step backwards was Mortal Kombat, obviously. Uh, okay, I think, yeah, I think Mortal now Kombat these came are going to be a little... on the Switch. Yeah. And it, it was a subpar game. Yeah. It, it was $70 on the Switch. $70. Yeah, $70, yeah. $70 on the Switch. And the graphical comparison between the two systems, you know, was night and day. I, I think that is what would keep companies right now from jumping over there is that people are like, no, this, this is garbage. Like, we're not even remotely going to buy it on this system because yeah, it's so much better. At the mm-hmm. same price on a this is where, PlayStation. This is where I, I tell gamers like 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 pick and choose your battles. Uh, you know, like you know, like like go to war with the pocketbook. You know, take these companies to task with your with with you know like shit. I, as much as I dislike GameStop, hmm. buy that shit pre owned. Like don't like <laughs> like like give like give the give the game advisor to work behind the counter like the money. You know. Mm-hmm. I also uh, want to say. That the two things actually. One, if you don't want to pay seventy dollars, like Laron said, like buy it, uh, buy it used, or I don't know, wait a year, go to Black Friday sales, and it'll be like half price at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, like the second thing I want to mention is when games go to eighty dollars, that that price per hour 
argument is going to happen even more than it does now, right? Like, True. you know, when you get a game like The Witcher that's like 200 hours long at least and those expansion passes, right? I mean, that game, you could have sold that game for 120 bucks with how much content is in that game. And then like, so let's say the next Witcher is like 70 or $80, like, and then you're going to compare it to the next Uncharted, which is $80, right? Like, I mean, Uncharted... What the next Uncharted is is not going to be any longer than probably twenty hours, right? Twenty five at the most, unless you're like a completionist, whatever. Hey, listen, listen, don't come, don't come, don't come at me about my man math when it comes to how I justify how I'm gonna spend money on a game. I mean, Do I'm not doing I'm, that. I'm not like I think I think Uncharted is totally worth the seventy dollars the price tag, right? Like, mm. what it? Well, I guess sixty at the time, but seventy like the next one, like Uncharted's amazing. I would pay that for those types of games but you know people are like and again i don't want to get in this conversation because we kind of had it like a couple months ago but free to play has also made the argument of like oh uh, yeah 70 dollars for a game when i can get thousands of hours in Fortnite for free technically right that's that's free exactly that's where i was <laughs> that's where i was that's where i was going to next like uh like i was gonna say like you know like uh it would be something to think about because games as a service are coming and, you know, like games as a service, like, you know, like they don't, they don't always charge you like the premium price for it. They charge you like an introductory price, sometimes 30, 40 bucks. And then all the microtransactions and all the expanded content and stuff, that's how they make their money, you know? So like, this is, this is an interesting topic that I feel like we should come back to in like a year or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. Especially like when the console refreshes come out, cause mm -hmm. that's happening. Right. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you, you notice how everybody's losing their mind because the Xbox Series S probably won't have a disk drive. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I can't wait. The end of yeah. physical games. Can't wait. Um, yeah. uh, to be fair, though, that's going to have a detachable disk drive via USB-C. That's gonna that be sounds weird. annoying. That's gonna be right, right? Because I have I have to use a uh, detached. I have to use a USB C uh, drive for my job. You know. Because yeah, but computers if gonna, don't come with built-in disk drives anymore. If they're going to phase out the one terabyte one, they have to have an option for. They have to have that's an option true. for people who want disks, and I know that's well, annoying. They probably, and, they probably have the they probably have the plug-in expansion slots for those for those terabyte freaking freaking memory cards. Yeah. There's a two terabyte. I call them memory one, cards. I'm being, I'm being facetious. I, I call them memory cards. <laughs> I I really want a two terabyte one. I'm gonna get one, but they're half of the console. So. <laughs> and, and 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 wait, do we know? Do we see? We don't know a lot about the new Series S. We don't know if it's going to be like on the chipset, like like how the PS5 is. Well, si since though that data released in 2021 or early 2022 or whatever, I'm wondering if the Black Series S is that. Because and they didn't want to pay for the components because supply chains were still, you know, they wanted to get as much of those components for the Series X as possible, the the refresh one. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if the one terabyte black one is that refresh. So it's a good it's a good possibility, but um, but yeah, like it's interesting times. Thank thank you Microsoft for leaking your own information. Thank yeah. you. Oh my gosh, dude! I'm so excited for that. And the in the controller with quieter thumbsticks. Oh my gosh, dude! Uh -huh. Somebody mentioned that the thumbsticks were really loud like two years ago, and it's bothered me ever since. I'm like, these quieter, sticks are so quieter thumbsticks. Yeah, quieter thumbsticks and like less possibility for drift. Yeah, it doesn't like it doesn't bother me when I'm playing a game and like you know I, either I have a uh, head headphones on or I have the TV turned up. But like when my kids and my wife are sleeping and I'm trying to play a game and those sticks are like super loud, even though we're on opposite ends of the house. I'm like, yikes. I hope, hope not. So, well, we did it. We did it. We survived another episode. Mm -hmm. oh, I almost didn't, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Have you been not Please sleeping don't. again? I've been Please playing, I've ahead. been playing games. I've been, I've been so like, Yesterday, uh, yesterday, yeah, yesterday, my wife and I were watching TV, and as soon as she went to bed, I started playing Oxenfree Two, and I'm like, I gotta finish this tonight. And I had I had no recollection of time, what time it was, uh, even though there's a clock right next, right by the TV, like, you know, on the other wall, right by the TV, and uh, I I finished it. I'm like, yes, I'm gonna go to bed early, and I finish this game, and I look at the clock, and it's like almost one thirty. I'm like, oh probably should go to bed uh so 
yeah, I, I've just, uh, that's my, that's my, <laughs> that's my quarterly goal is to play more, more games in this last quarter of the year. <laughs> I appreciate that goal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be hard, but I can do it. I can do it. You can do it, Corey. I can. Also, we believe in you. I also downloaded Final Fantasy Seven uh, Remake, too. Nice. So I, I got that's, a, a, that's another game I'm currently playing, but I, I just haven't been adding it to my list. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna play it just to see. I also should probably play the original just because I want to know what the changes are. Um, <clears throat> no, so. no. Well, they have that speed mode, speed mode where you don't have to like grind or or get experience. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's a new thing. Like, so, yeah, like um, I I refuse to go back to the original Final Fantasy Seven. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I like, kind of I, I played it so much when when it was new, yeah. when it was a current game. Mm-hmm. I no, I I'm, I can't. Yeah, I just uh, since the remake and we talking about doing it for book club at some point. Like, I I want. Oh, that's a loft. That's a lofty game. It's the 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 first one, the remake. Yeah, it's like twenty five hours. You can mainline it in like twenty five hours. Yeah, yeah, we can Would do it though. We we fit Final Fantasy sixteen and one. Yeah, we we packed the shit out of that, and yeah. we also had to quiet black a little bit. Sorry, black. <laughs> um, what else? Oh yeah, okay. So we're just gonna we're gonna wrap it up. We're going to get on another tangent, and that's not a good thing this far into the show. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, before we go, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody who's listening and or watching. Um, if you're a patron, we also appreciate you. Um, you can go to patreon.com slash boss rush media to uh, check out the tiers. We are going to make some changes that we are going to announce probably the next episode because we got to, you know make the dock and fix everything and streamline it and stuff. But it's going to be, I think it's going to be a good thing that we can keep consistent, consistent um, going forward. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a good time. Uh, Ron, Stephanie, Pat, thank you for your time tonight as always. Um, Real fast. No, real fast. No. What, what do you want? I just want to let everyone know that coming up on episode 80 of Boss Rush After Dark, we're going to be talking about our favorite bedtime activities. Mm. Stay tuned for that one. And then Corey and Stephanie will be in the hot seat as they talk about parenting in this current uh-huh. game. Uh-huh. Mm. Is that a good idea? All that all that, and maybe more on episode 80 of Boss Rush After Dark. Dun, dun, dun. Big announcement, though. Speaking of After Dark, it's coming back every week. Yes, we're bigger. giving the people what they want. More yes. holes. Yes. Bigger and better. Yeah. Bigger, longer, and uncut. better. Harder, harder stronger, uncut. faster. Uncut. I don't know. Some some of them might be cut. That's, Full uh, frontal. I'm just, I'm just thinking veiny. of the South Park movie. Remember, bigger, longer, and uncut. <laughs> and I'm thinking of circumcision. Mm, okay, on that note. <laughs> don't thank everybody for watching and or listening. Good and night, until everybody. next time. <laughs> oh, ah. We love you. Goodbye. If you want to be a Patreon producer, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash Media, and find out which tier is right for you. Our Patreon producers at the $5 tier or higher for this month are Adriel Munger, Austin Campbell, Celeste Roberts, Christian S., Sana Dierig, Francisco Santillan, and Rebecca Jewell. Thank you for your continued support. <laughs>